is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Broad Church, Season 2, Episode 5. In this episode, it turns out that Susan doesn't really stand up super well under cross examination, which works out pretty well for the prosecution. Uh, also, Tommy is really struggling with how to cope with what his father is. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Jesse for commissioning this episode. So this one was pretty tough. <laughs> um, mostly the shit going on with Tommy. I mean, it is Tommy, right? I just realized that I called him that like all last episode and I never actually double checked, but it's Tom and Tommy, right? I just feel so bad for Ellie y'all. Um, the way that he is blaming her for this, it's, it's simultaneously so understandable and it's such an easy thing to reach for, you know, the, well, he's definitely innocent. And if it weren't for you, he wouldn't be in jail. And I really want to know what, what it is that he knows about his father's confession because he saw Alec following a, a signal into the backyard. He watched Alec go through his home to the back garden. And what did he think was happening there? Does he believe his father was framed? He knew that Tommy and his dad were hanging out. I mean, Danny. So... The thing is that it doesn't, I'm approaching this from the wrong direction because I want to know how he can rationally think that his father isn't guilty. And that's not what it's about. It's not about his father rationally thinking or him rationally thinking about his father. It's the fact that it's his father and he simply doesn't want to believe that. And there's really nothing to be done when somebody has decided that they, they don't want to believe a thing, you can't make them believe the thing. And this is, uh, I just hate, what I hate the most about this is that it feels like he's playing into the prosec the, or the defense's storyline. And the whole thing, I, I know that I've talked about this already and forgive me, but I just don't understand how you sleep at night defending somebody that you know is guilty. I just don't know how you do it. Like her whole, everybody deserves their day in court is just, it's, it feels so untrue and, and it feels disingenuous. It feels like a rationalization that one makes to oneself as to why their job isn't despicable. And I don't buy it. You know, I don't even, I don't know if I believe that she even feels that way. And they're trying to poke holes in this story because of what their job is with no concern for the like actual ramifications of what they're saying. And that's not to say that if they hadn't poked holes in the way they had, that Tommy wouldn't still feel how he does about his mother. She, he, he may still have wound up here, but they're feeding into it. And I'm also like, so disgusted with his father. It's really funny, actually, considering that this is all about Tom, how little we have heard from him. We had the one scene last episode where they attempt to po to examine him and he just completely falls apart and they decide not to put him on the stand at all. Um, 
And other than that, we haven't actually seen him expressing his own feelings or opinions. That was him attempting a performance for them. But in terms of how he's coping and justifying this all to himself, I would like to hear a little bit more about that because I don't really know if he said something to the vicar about like, there's, I'm not the only one, everybody has secrets. And I'd like a little bit more of that, please. Because so far, the only secrets that are being unearthed are the ones that are like, from new characters, from, you know, areas of the town that I haven't been particularly interested in from the last episode. Is there something that we need to know about people that we've become familiar with already? I just feel like I would like a little bit of forward motion on that. Um, El Jefe in the chat says, if you've ever had a trusted friend or loved one accused of something, it brings up so many conflicting, unpleasant feelings for a kid. It must be totally overwhelming. For me, the accusation against my trusted person seemed extremely credible, even though it probably wasn't. I'm not sure how I would have handled it had the cops come to me. I might have buried my loved one, even though they were innocent because they'd done something to me as a kid. Yeah, that brings up a good point that I had actually meant to reference, which was for me as a kid, I did not really trust people pretty, pretty early on. So I don't know how much of a factor that plays, but for me, I don't think it would have been hard for me to believe any given thing about adults in my life. I just wasn't the kind of kid who the, the instinct that some children have to believe the best of people that they love was simply not there for me. And that's not because I saw my parents or like aunts and uncles or anybody doing things that were like fucked up. And I was like, well, I know they're capable of it because I saw it. I just, I think that I grew up with people around me who had experienced terrible things at the hands of folks they were supposed to trust. Both of my parents had been molested as children by like, you know, authority figures, multiple authority figures. And so I knew as a kid, right, like from a very young age that a lot of adults aren't to be trusted. And there was even an aspect of like, you know, knowing about how that can be a cyclical thing. And it wasn't, I'm saying all of this in terms that are much more eloquent than I would as a kid. But I remember as young as like the age of five or six, understanding that there were adults that would hurt you and that they often seemed like good people. And that was how they got away with it. That that was like intrinsic to how they were able to hurt was the fact that they did not seem like they would be the kind of person who would hurt. So it's just something that I don't really relate to, even if it were a loved one. And I, I mean, I, I feel this way also about like murder and people and TV and movies and stuff being like, he would never, he's not capable of something like anybody is capable of anything. That's not to say I believe anybody is at like absolutely anybody is capable of pedophilia. That's its own thing. But just saying that you don't think somebody is capable of something particularly violent, that doesn't hold any water for me. You know, I have seen people who are otherwise some of the gentlest kindest people I've ever ever known get into a rage and they are scary. And I think that's actually true of people who are gentler. When they finally are provoked to really get into a rage, it is much, much more alarming because by the time they express it, they are so far beyond the place that, you know, like it's just, so yeah, I think that's really it for me is that Tommy is just coming at this from a very different place than I was at his age. And like I said, for me, it was as young as like five and six years old that I understood. And he is a teenager. And at this point, I really would have thought he'd get it. And I am certain that this is how it goes sometimes. I am certain that there are people who just absolutely want to defend their parents or family or friends or whatever, 
no matter what. And there's a sort of feeling of loyalty to that. But I would really enjoy seeing him sat down with somebody and having them just ask him questions about his explanations for how certain things happened. Because obviously Ellie isn't the person to do that with. He has a, he feels a way about her. Apparently he feels that she has abandoned him because that's what he says to Mark last episode. And it's just, all she is trying to do is get him back. This episode is like, that's their, the, their big moment is her trying to reach out to him. And so his feelings of abandonment are really him feeling abandoned, like that she abandoned his father. I feel like the damage here is so complete that even if he were to realize his father was guilty, I don't know that he'd be able to like repair his relationship with Ellie. It just doesn't seem like this is something they're going to get past. And he basically says that she asks whether or not, you know, he'll come back to live with her. He says, no. And she says something like, all right, well soon then. And he says no again. And her acting in that scene, and especially when he like walks in and just says something like, are you going to cry again? I was so glad that his aunt was like, what the fuck? You know, like, seriously, dude, it, it's weird because he's like, he's mad that his mother isn't defending his father, but also she's like not supposed to feel anything. He's just being so deeply unfair. This is why I don't want to have kids, dude. Kids are such a disaster. Like, what are we, what, what are we doing? Um, all right. So I'm going to, I'm going to back up here and start from the beginning again. Um, Ellie, the, the, the first scene is her talking to Tom and him like refusing to stay with her. And she says, I love you even more than chocolate as she's hugging him. He finally agrees to a hug. And after the hug, he immediately walks away without even looking at her. And she just kind of crumples up. She's so good, you guys. She's so good. It's really annoying. Um, there's just this hopelessness, you know, and uh, at least she's got we Fred. Um, I, I do have to admit to that. I really rather like Alex attempts to try and like be understanding He's just so misguided in the way that he does it. You know, like he lets her beat up Joe. Joe. Why was I calling him Tom? Did I call him Tom? I called her husband Tom a bunch of times. I'm pretty sure. Everybody forgive me. Okay. I'm sorry. There was a long gap between episodes. Um, But so he tried to do that. That wound up like souring their case. Now he tries to tell her like, you know, you don't need to come with me to interview this woman if you don't want to, um, because he's trying to give her an out. And later on is asking like, are you, um, I think he asks something about Tommy, like Tom and evidence, but she just basically is like, I don't want to talk about it. Um, but yeah, he, he's just very not good with emotions. Bless him. So, they are going to interview the bridesmaid at this wedding that allegedly uh, what's her face's husband was having sex with Ricky Gillespie was having sex with. And she says that he tried it on with her. Um, and she says he was after me all night. He even followed me back to my room when I went to change my shoes because my heels were killing me. And he had this little silver hip flask. He kept trying to make me have a drink with him, but I threw him out a bit much. He was there with his wife. The last I saw, he was heading back for the car park. Um, okay. A lot to unpack here again with feeling like the show is really pointing us towards Ricky as the suspect here. Therefore, I don't think it was him. However, it does really sound like he was trying to roofie her for sure. And later on, when Alec goes and talks to um, Lee Ashworth, Lee says 
that he got the Rohypnol from Ricky, who himself got it in Amsterdam when he took a trip there. So, yeah. And Alex says, I haven't heard any reports of him trying that sort of thing with anyone. Um, do you think, and she says, do you think that's something all four of them used to do? When we're done in court today, we'll talk to her. So we cut from there to um, the lawyer lady. And she is looking out the window and asking about when was the last time you got your eyesight tested? And she is asking this of nobody in practice for the actual trial. But then when she turns around, she's in court with her ridiculous wig that we won't talk about. And here comes this beautiful scene with her and Susan. I really, really enjoyed this. Susan is just such an odd character. I really like her as a character because you go back and forth on, on kind of liking her and then hating her and then kind of like feeling sorry for her and then hating her. And it's just, you're all over the place, you know? So Jocelyn has this very well established means of attack. First of all, how good is your eyesight even? And Susan says something like how she eats a lot of carrots. I can see the moon and that's a fair distance. And as she says this, Back in the, um, at the defense's desk, we see Sharon glance at Fleabag with this expression on her face, like, ugh, because obviously this is supposed to be their witness and she's being fucking smart and it's just not a good look. So then we begin this, uh, whole, you hadn't seen your son for 28 years in Mr. Carter's sworn statement to the police, he says, I don't even know who she is. I don't want anything to do with her. And she says, police get it wrong. Police get it wrong all the time. It's a fact. And the judge has to cut in and say, it's not actually. <sighs> Stick to answering the questions you've been asked, Miss Wright. Okay, look, she's not wrong, but where the fuck has this judge been this whole time? There have been so many moments where she could have stepped in and been like, that's not the line of questioning we were pursuing, or, you know, that wasn't an appropriate response, or you're right, this is irrelevant, and she hasn't, and it's just like, ugh. Um, so Jocelyn rightfully asks, why, when you saw Danny's body on the beach, didn't you just call an ambulance and overall just keeps poking and prodding at her reasoning behind everything. And the whole like answer of, Oh, I didn't want to dump Nigel in it. When you came up here and voluntarily testified against him, it doesn't really make any sense, you know? Um, and then the fact that she had the skateboard and she claims, I thought the family would want it back when she gave it to Tom, not back to the family. None of it makes any sense. Um, and this is when what she said to Maggie at the broad church echo when she broke in comes back to haunt her. Now, unfortunately, there are no witnesses to this. As Jocelyn says, why would she lie? Which that's a really good question. There's no particular reason to like, you know, and the only thing that it turns out, I think at least, that she was trying to hide was her connection to the man who had killed and raped his daughter. So it is even more jarring looking back and realizing that like I had this whole theory about her being involved in a like drug ring and it turns out it was just like this personal thing that it turns out is actually sort of easy to dig up um yeah and she the just the whole way that she 
presents herself is so antagonistic and unlikable and untrustworthy. When Jocelyn says, why would she lie? Susan says, she's a journalist. And Jocelyn says, right, journalists and police lie. And you're the only honest woman here. And Susan just says, if you like. Yeah, girl, you just sunk yourself. Now, is this on purpose? Like, I don't think it's on purpose. But is it on purpose? Like, that's the only reason I can think of, is that she decided to go up there and let herself be like, let somebody poke holes in everything in order to make sure that Nigel wasn't even a suspect, that it would be completely stricken, you know? I don't know. That's it. Because otherwise, what the fuck is she even doing? <sighs> and in the end, we have Sharon and Fleabag on the stairs having a massive fight. And Sharon says, if you spent a little less time trying to tell me how to do my job and a bit more time on your own work, we'd stand a chance of getting him off. Because evidently it was Fleabag's job to vet and test this woman to make sure that she didn't make this kind of mistake. And she didn't do her due diligence is what we are led to believe. It's interesting because I'm not sure if that's true. We have then the scene between, well, there's one scene between her and Jocelyn when they're out smoking on the veranda and they, like Jocelyn just tells her chin up and that's it. But I'm kind of wonder. Uh, I won't talk about it now. I'm going to wait because I want their actual words in front of me later. Um, so yeah. Jeff is in the chat. As a lawyer's kid, courtroom scenes drive me insane. The judge always lets people do crazy shit that would never fly in a real court. Yeah, Th that has been particularly egregious this season. Like, I don't know, you know, it's the sort of thing where I feel like I don't I don't know well enough how strict some judges are because I know judge, it's like sort of up to their discretion whether they want to let shit fly or not. But the fact that it's never actually objected to at all is kind of where I'm like, somebody would have something to say about this. Somebody would stop. Like, there is just nothing but objecting in a lot of the actual trials that I've seen, you know? And it's weird how, I don't know, maybe that's not a thing in British court. Um, so anyway, then we have this moment where Ellie is talking to Susan and we have the moment where Susan tells her, you knew, we all know, we all turn a blind eye. And it's one of those moments of sort of a comeuppance a little bit for Ellie, who tried to say to her, how could you not know last season? And it's like, she really gets under Ellie's skin. But at the same time, I'm like, Ellie, don't you know that she's specifically trying to like, that's her goal is to like, get to you the same way that you were trying to get to her. Don't let it She's just fucking with you. And it worked. And it's just so annoying. But as she leaves, she's telling Alec, they'll always think I knew no matter what the verdict, they'll always think I was in on it. And he says, just give them time. Oh, thanks for that shitty platitude. That'll fix everything. <laughs> oh, she's so fun. So then we go to Claire. And first of all, Claire does the thing with Ellie. I thought that that was supposed to be between us. And I'm like, girl, this is like an open murder investigation. I mean, it's not like technically open, but like for all intents and purposes, it's open. You don't get to just say anything and expect it to not get back to him. Like, come on, bitch. You are not that stupid. This has to be purposeful. I can't think she's this stupid. I don't know. I don't have a good grip on Claire. She's a mystery. Um... I went to see a friend, Marie, like I told you before, except I didn't stay over. I came home and had a drink with Lee and he spiked my drink with Rohypnol. And then when I woke up in the morning, he was cleaning uh, the floors and doing laundry and said that he f had, uh, he fancied a spring clean. 
And of course, of course, Ellie has to be like the next morning when two girls get reported missing, you didn't think to tell anyone. And she says, no, I didn't want to think it was possible. And I, the one thing that sort of saves Ellie for me, because it would be really hard for me. And I said this before with Susan's situation where it was her husband raping her daughter. I truly do not believe that Susan didn't see the signs unless she was like never home because the perpetrator and the victim living under the same roof. I'm sorry. You had to know something was up. There's no way. I just don't buy it. I just don't. Ellie, though, it's just the perpetrator and he manages to cover really well. I mean, you know, the whole thing with him drugging her. I have to think that Claire is just making or he doesn't drug her. He she takes a sleeping pill. But I think that that maybe was where Claire got the idea to present this as being, you know, I don't know. Um, but that the way that he like he has really good alibis and the person that he was victimizing or was about to victimize and wound up killing, I guess that's victimizing. They were not under the same roof. That makes sense to me how you could not know that was going on. You know, when you trust your partner, you're not questioning every step they take out of the house. Even if they are a little bit later than you thought they should be, you just put it down to like, oh, that's traffic. Mm, they get held up talking to somebody like whatever. It's always really like depressing to me when I see couples who sort of like shadow each other's every step, check each other's phones, that sort of thing. I find to be really like you're in a bad situation. Just get out. If you can't even trust a person to like not be fucking around on their phone with somebody, you need to break up. I say this as somebody who was in that situation and we needed to break up. And so Ellie trusting her husband like that, it makes sense. I don't blame her or think that there was any, I don't think it's unbelievable at all that she would have completely gone without knowing a thing. Um, so this is when Alex says, this is now the third version of that night that you have come up with. Why couldn't you tell me this before? And he calls this number in front of her. Whose number is that? I don't know. It was an incoming call. I think it was a wrong number. No, it was an outgoing call. Yeah, that's because I, I called it back. Mm -hmm. And she says, now I feel like I'm being questioned. And he says, too bloody right. You were my key witness. And now you say you were lying all along. And she says, I wasn't lying. I was just trying to protect him. And I'm like, bitch, what do you think lying is for? I wasn't lying. I was just trying to protect him. That's lying. You lied to protect him. I wasn't lying. You've literally come up with like a bunch of different scenarios. Like, what are you even talking about? It's just that uh, she's just got no leg to stand on. So this is now definitively what happened that night. And she says, yes. And he says, really? And they both just stare at her. Stare. Oh, it's so good. And he finally says, Claire. And then there is, um, uh, <sighs> he was here when you went away and we had sex upstairs. Oh my God. <laughs> oh. She says he's like a, a drug to me and I can't stop myself. And I love the expression on Ellie's face. Ellie is disgusted. It is so fucking funny to me, the expression on her face. She's just like, you are an alien. I have no idea what the fuck, like how. Girl, look, <laughs> it's just unthinkable. I think that the main thing for Ellie is it seemed like, there was no way that Lee Ashworth wasn't guilty. Like everybody was so certain that the idea of still being willing to sleep with a man who might've been capable is just baffling. Whereas if we're coming at it and we're assuming that Claire is telling the truth, 
then Claire doesn't either doesn't think he did it or she thinks he may have, but that only adds to his appeal for her for some, for some reason. Maybe that's because like, you know, we saw in the, in the scene when they were about to have sex again, she says, will you tie me up? And I'll be honest, I kind of wondered if she was going to have him tie her up so that she could have like rope marks and then tell them that he had like forced himself on her or that he had just tied her up and like, you know, searched the house. I thought that maybe she was setting things up to be able to lie. And then when they come in this for this interview with her and she seems fine, I was like, oh, okay. So it genuinely was that she just wanted to play with bondage. Now, my only concern is that they included the will you tie me up because they want to start pointing at her like being into kink and thus maybe being deviant and then participating in like murder. And I really hate linking kink with like somebody being actually harmful because those things are not related. And we'll just see. I don't want to jump the gun and get upset about it when it's maybe not what they're going to do. But there was a bit when, when it turned out that she wasn't asking him to tie her up because she was going to specifically do something with that. Then I started to be like, Oh, well, what was that meant to mean then? You know, because speaking as somebody who enjoys being tied up during sex, it's just purely for the sake of it. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not out here murdering anybody. Um, but anyway, so she, the, the whole scene here with her, it's like, I love this moment. She's like expecting something from Alec. I don't know. He looks at her. He gets up and he says, Miller, come on. And she says, I don't want to be on my own, please. Um, girl, you don't want to be on your own? What are you, who are you fooling? You had sex with a man. Like, like, you can't be that afraid of him. You can't be in much danger. He was inside you. Like, it just her whole trying to, like, regain this victimhood that she has spun her story around. And she's trying to do the whole, like, I can't control myself around him. And I'm like, I don't trust you. I don't think that's what it is. I don't think that he's, like, this abusive partner who has you under his thrall and you're simply going back to him because you're so broken and, and the, because, like, you know, I've seen relationships like that and I know that's real, but I think that's what she's trying to make it look like. And yet she did tell them that she slept with him and she didn't have to. I wasn't sure if she would. And I don't know why she did other than maybe she decided now that we're putting everything out on the table. But like, I, didn't, I just don't trust her. Um, yeah. And they said they both just leave. And she's sitting at the table, like looking really panicked, like she isn't sure what to do next. And then we just cut away. And I was like, oh, okay. So next scene, I haven't talked about this. This sort of started last episode, but Father Paul had suggested because like evidently Beth wanted to get into some, um, her, into some like volunteering to sort of help her get over Danny's death, get past at the very least. And she had a suggestion for something that is pretty much, it's already exists. It's, it's, was an idea that wasn't new. And both, both Paul and I think Maggie was there and they both were like, yeah, I'm sorry, but like, nobody's going to put money towards a project that's already out there. And then they suggested dealing with people who are sex offenders and who are basically like trying to recover from that. And she goes and talks to Mark about this because it's important to her that, that she do something to get over it. But Mark absolutely wants nothing to do with this project. Um, she says, why won't you engage with this? And he says, because I don't understand why I don't understand why you need to do it, Beth. I don't, I really don't. It's like, you're picking at a scab, trying to make it bleed or something. Look at what we've got here. 
You know what it's like. She'll be grown before you know it. And I don't want to miss that again. I want to be here for her for every moment. And she says, I'm here for her, but I can still think about Danny. It's not one or the other. I need to do this. And he says, fine, I don't. And this is the kind of thing that as much as I feel really badly for her in that he doesn't really support this, this is one of the difficult things about being a partner to somebody who deals with things in a really different way than you do. And this is something that Owen and I have been sort of navigating recently, where we both deal with depression, but we both have a really different reaction to it. And thus, each of us doesn't realize when the other is going through it, because we each cope so differently. And that's what's happening here. It's grief. And what's working for him is moving past where they are or moving past what they have left behind and focusing on where they are and what they have. And for her, it's engaging with the trauma of it in a way that I honestly do understand. It's not for me. I think I would probably take Mark's tack more than anything and focus on the now and try and put the past behind me if I could. But her like really focusing on not wanting to let this happen again makes sense also. And it, it just, it's hard to like, it's just hard to watch the conversation because she just wants him to be with her on this. And she understands why he isn't so she doesn't like yell at him when he says fine but i don't it's not like she's like well i can't believe you she just sort of accepts it and walks away but it does make you feel sort of lonely you know this the the f realizing that you are about to go and do something that is potentially really traumatic all by yourself and indeed, as we see later, she goes into, I think that the meat is going to be in a church. Um, but she goes to it and she's very nervous. You can see that she's a little bit worried about how this is going to be. And she walks in. Yeah, it's in the church. And she sees these men sitting there. And she stands there staring at all of them. One of them turns and looks at her. And all of a sudden, it's just like too real. And she sees Danny sitting at his computer typing. And you see this sort of wave of like rage wash over her. And she runs right the fuck out of there. And girl, I feel you. Like... There is just a level of compassion that you need for people who have committed these kinds of crimes. And like, there is a part of me that knows a lot of people who are pedophiles don't want to be like this and they know it's horrifying. And I do feel for the fact that they don't feel they can change. Like there's, you know... And it sucks. Don't get me wrong. But there's a difference between pitying people who are fucked up and actively uh, participating in their rehabilitation. I just don't think I could do it. You know, I just don't like, I just don't think I'd have the stomach for it either. And the fact that she turns around and runs out of there, I was honestly kind of proud of her, proud of her. She may work her way up to being able to handle this, but I personally would be fine with it if she just realized this wasn't really for her after all. I, you know, um, meanwhile, speaking of people who are trying to be compassionate, we have Father Paul, who had been going to see Joe in prison and thought Joe was actually repentant. And he gets approached by the defense because they want him to be a character witness. 
And they basically like kind of blackmail him a little bit. This scene, he's so good. I love his acting here. Um, he says, no, I'm not going to do this. Joe is guilty. Sharon does the whole, well, did he confess to you? Why not let the jury decide? If you're so sure about his guilt, why have you been visiting him? And he looks surprised and says, he told you? And I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, even if he didn't tell them, your name has to be on the like visitor registry. Like, th There's very easy ways to find out who all has been going to see him. And it's kind of bonkers to me that you thought you could keep this a secret. This is a really high profile case at this point. It's kind of shocking that nobody has noticed yet. So, you know, the the whole moment where he realizes that they know. He says, I went to see him because I believe in forgiveness and redemption. I hoped to find a penitent man. But since you showed up, that seems to have gone out the window. And this is when Fleabag says, do the, latter, do the Latimers know that you've been visiting Joe? And, you know, it's, it's posited as this very innocent question, like, do they know? And it's 100% like, it would be a real shame if they found out that you'd been visiting Joe. And I'm like, um, I think it would be more of a shame if they saw him get on the stand and be a character witness to their child's murderer. Just saying, I feel like that's worse. I mean, maybe that's just me. I don't know. But I feel like that's worse. It, I, you know, as much as I think that Beth will have a strong reaction to finding out that he went to see Joe, I think that she would understand him being like, I was, I thought that he was going to repent. And he didn't. He's just refusing to accept responsibility. And if he said that, I think that she would come around and realize like, he did what he had to do as a priest attempting to extend forgiveness and he didn't want it. And that's different, you know, but then going up on that stand, I really hope that he doesn't give into this because like by the end of this scene, he hasn't actually made his decision um, Sharon does the whole, all have like sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. <sighs> a member of your parish is in crisis. Are you really going to desert him in his hour of need? Ew. It's such a like wrong headed and disingenuous framing of the situation. I just find it really gross. He isn't in crisis. He's facing the consequences of his actions. And she can do the whole like, well, he didn't confess directly to you. Um, yeah, he never even denied it when they were in private conversation. He just said, well, I'm not the only one with secrets. It's just so disgusting. Like the whole the whole way that everything about their interactions with every person on this show has been so gross and and even even down to them, like lying to uh, Becca, who owns the hotel and telling her that their stay has been amazing when it's been just shite. It's just they are complete liars all the time with everyone. So then we see him and Becca. And he's at the beach and he says, I have to tell you, I've been visiting Joe Miller in prison. I've been praying with him. And she backs off a little and says, are you kidding? And he says, I thought I could save him. I thought he was repentant. But, and she says, have you not been at the trial? And I'm like, well, to be fair, I wish that he would say it. It wasn't until like the trial started. He wasn't behaving quite the same way until the trial began. So, he, you know, basically like stopped going to see Joe, like at, after that one conversation where Joe made it clear that, yeah, I'm going to plead not guilty and I'm not going to take response. Like, I wish that he would just tell her about the timing of it and be like, yeah, I have seen him at the trial. That's why I haven't gone to see him since. And he says, I think I've made a mistake. 
And she gets this look on her face like, fucking, you think? And he says, I just needed to tell someone. And she just sort of like looks at her hands and then says, I feel like you've made me a part of it. And that's the end of the scene. And I have to say, I was genuinely surprised that she isn't more understanding of his position in this. Again, I wish that he had outlined the timing of it all a little bit more. But it just feels like, I mean, he's a priest, like you've got to know, he's not going to handle this whole thing like a regular person. That's the point, right? He's not a priest and whatever he is. Um, so then we have the scene with Jocelyn and she hands her assistant, I need you to read and record these as well, and hands him like three files. And I was so appreciative of how much he puts his foot down here because I was afraid he was going to let her bully him into this. And he says, I can't. And she says, well, you have to. And his response is, Jocelyn, I have far too much else to do. She has the nerve to say, well, then work faster. Bitch, if you don't sit the fuck down, how dare you? You are covering for some shit that you don't want anybody else to know about. And insinuating he isn't doing enough. How about you tell him the fucking truth instead of making him feel like he is somehow letting you down? This is inexcusable. I'm so grossed out. And he says, no, read your own documents. I'm not sitting up until 3 a.m. reading around so you can sit, reading aloud so you can sit back with your eyes closed. And as he says this and hands everything back to her and says, I'm going home to see my family, Maggie comes in and is giving Jocelyn this like, mm-hmm kind of expression. She knows exactly what the fuck just happened. Now, I had theorized that they were maybe sisters last episode, or not last episode, but the first episode where we meet um, Jocelyn in the first place. And I'm sort of wondering if they weren't like romantically involved. They're of an age. And there's a sort of vibe between the two of them. I don't know, maybe it's just like they're exes, but they're friendly or what. And Maggie does know, evidently, because I wasn't positive. I thought that she knew based on her self-pity comment. But when she says, are you going to tell him the truth? Jocelyn just shakes her head. And I'm like, why not, though? Like, genuinely, literally, why not? Because all that will do will increase his understanding of your position here. And you get an assistant who could keep their mouth shut. Because maybe you don't even tell them. You tell him and he gives the instructions to the assistant. And then you don't have to worry about this stuff. And it's your last case. Allegedly, who knows? And we can all move on and be happy. It just sort of like the fact that she's choosing to not tell for me doesn't feel understandable. I just don't really get it. Um, so, oh my God. So then we go to <laughs> Ellie and Alec. And I love her false cheer at the fact that there is a carnival that is built right in the backyard behind the house that he has been staying in. Uh, Because I couldn't understand why she was so cheery and laughing about this so much. But yeah, he is just so cranky about it. And honestly, it is pretty amusing. So they get to his house and here's Ricky to apologize allegedly. But it turns out that he knows that Lee Ashworth is in town. And he goes to Lee's house and beats the shit out of him. There's a sense afterwards that maybe Lee has a couple of broken ribs. It's pretty bad. And I was kind of surprised that he didn't kill him. I mean, I guess there's a witness there, so he can't. But he says something like, I got what I came for. And I was like, did you? Also, I had sort of posited the theory that maybe Ricky had been covering up something for someone else. And that because I don't really think that he's guilty, maybe it was something to do with his daughter or his wife. And he like is 
his daughter is sequestered away somewhere still alive and he's like protecting her. And that maybe Lee didn't have anything to do with it. But based on the the fact that he beats up Lee at all, either he's decided that he's going to completely commit to the bit and that beating up Lee is only something that he would do if he really knows for sure uh, that he himself isn't guilty. In which case, that's pretty smart. Or he really didn't have anything to do with his daughter's disappearances and deaths. And he truly thinks that Lee did it. And I just can't decide because like the whole thing with him having Rohypnol and trying to get the bridesmaid to drink it, that feels to me like pretty damning shit. And I, I'm trying to think, you know, there's a lot of stuff that can be, um, and, and this will be done in like some of your shittier mysteries. Um, cause there's a lot of shitty mystery out there, guys. I don't know if you know this, but as somebody who likes to read cozy mysteries on my downtime, a lot of them have that sort of thing where somebody's walking by and they overhear one half of a conversation and out of context, it sounds really sinister, but then it's recontextualized and you find out it was harmless. But even in the moment that you're only hearing the half that the character's hearing, you still know precisely what's actually going on. And you're like, oh, God, she's going to hear this and she's going to think X, Y, Z. And it's not that at all. And now I have to wait 50 pages for her to fucking catch up and realize that it wasn't what she thought. And I just don't know if there's anything that can be done to recontextualize him trying to get a bridesmaid to drink out of his hip flask. Like what, what other way is there to take that other than he was trying to drug her? I genuinely can't think of another way to go with that. So yeah, I really, I I can't, I got nothing. Um, so, and, and as he's like standing there talking to D.I. Hardy too, I should mention that Lee is like right across the street watching this whole conversation. So he is aware that Ricky is in town and um, still doesn't really like hide or protect himself, which uh, I, is this all part of like a big charade? I don't think so. Based on the expression on his face, he's not happy to see Ricky. So then we have this like weird sort of flashback memory and we've got the two daughters running through the woods and it looks like they're sort of playing hide and seek. And Lee is hiding behind a tree playing with the two girls. And there's a sense of his, like the older sister pulling away behind, like the younger sister sees him and smiles and giggles at him. But then the younger sister sort of pulls back and there's a look of concern on her face and then all of a sudden, Ricky pops up behind him and grabs him and says, can't hide from me, mate. And like in a very playful way, but also like he's drunk. And Lee does not seem comfortable in that scene. He seems startled and a little upset. Like he doesn't either. He doesn't like that Ricky saw him at all. He doesn't like being touched maybe there's just something like, I don't know, but the, it was a weird sort of flashback that I still don't feel like I totally understand what was going on in that scene. Were all four of them playing like hide and go seek? What is Ricky? It's just weird. Um, So let's see. I'm trying to see. We have the conversation between him and Ellie where he's talking about Pippa and how she was sporty, a good runner, didn't like losing. Um, what did she want to be when she grew up? And he says it kept changing. Uh, the last few months it was a hairdresser and we see her standing there as her hair is being braided by Claire and Claire looks up and gives him this big smile that feels very intimate. So, she says you were at a wedding with Kate and you were together all night. And he says, yeah, I had to look after her. She was pissed sign of things to come. So that's interesting. Two totally different versions of this story here. 
Meanwhile, in the background, Alec is starting to kind of fall apart because he's got this pain. So she asks about Lisa. She was my niece. I don't think I realized that. I don't think I even realized that, like... um. So he says, she babysat every other week. Sometimes she'd stay over. Other times I would take her home. And Ellie asks, did you fancy her? And he says, she was my niece. And she says, I had to ask. And he said, no, you didn't. And I'm like, "Mm, yeah, she did. Look, dudes. I don't know who needs to hear this, but you are not accepted from all of the shitty men's behavior in the world simply because you don't believe you seem like the kind of guy who would do such a thing and everybody should know that you're not that kind of guy. You're a man. Men are scum. I'm sorry. I don't make the rules. Y'all made the rules and you decided to act up. Guess what? So, you know, like there are any number of girls who have been molested and assaulted and raped by uncles. Her being your niece is so irrelevant that it's actually upsetting. So, yeah, absolutely. She did need to ask. Um, And... We see him leaving from there. It seems like that sort of set him over the edge. Ellie asks Alec how much he actually looked into Ricky at the time. And she begins to get pretty obsessive with this case because, as she puts it, she doesn't want to go home. Like, her life is falling apart. And she decides to go back into the house. Alec is going to sit outside and deal with his fucking heart pain and taking pills. And she's going to go over everything. So that is indeed what she does all night long. And as she does this, he goes over to Jocelyn's house and gets his will set in place. And uh, this was something that made me kind of stop and go, ooh, maybe I should do that. Like, I'm not sick or anything, but it's probably not a bad idea. It's not like I have a lot to lose um, or give away. Um, She says, things were complicated. Uh, He's talking to Jocelyn during this conversation. He asked her about having kids. And she says, I made them more so. I was at a point when when I should have been strong and I wasn't. And I missed the person I was supposed to be with. And he says, did you ever tell him? And I couldn't help but go, hmm, heteronormative much? Because uh, we don't know that it was him. I mean, one can assume if they're talking about having kids that it probably was. But, you know, maybe not. They might have been choosing to be adopted, you know, like choosing to adopt instead and having a same-sex partner or one of you getting pregnant with a donor or something. But she says no. And he says, maybe you should. And she says, it's always easy to recognize mistakes in hindsight, much harder to fix them now. Um, so <laughs> this, I feel like, is a bit of a breadcrumb. And I really have no idea where that's going or why that's going to be important. But and maybe it won't. But I don't know. We'll see. Um, so eventually, I have to speed things up a little here. We have two things that I really need to talk about. The first one is we have Sharon going to visit her son in prison. He's been in a fight. And she wants to get information out of him to get the people who did this to him in trouble, which he is just, of course, not going to cooperate because why would you? That's just going to put him in danger. Like, of course not. So basically what happens is that he yells at her for not being able to fix this. The fact that she should have been able to sort it out so that he wasn't in prison at all 
and hasn't makes him angry. And she takes this out on Jocelyn at the end of the episode. She goes up to her, shows her the picture of her son. That's what they've done to him in prison. And Jocelyn basically accuses her of somebody who does not take responsibility for her own problems in her life. And that she's constantly blaming other people for when things go wrong. And that she knew, even if she did decide to help Sharon, that if she failed and her son went to jail anyway, that Sharon would blame her forever. All the time you worked for me, all those poor me single mother speeches, don't put it on me. It's down to you and no one else. And, you know, that's the sort of thing that it really feels like, one, super privileged, two, super classist, three, low-key racist. I'm not super on Jocelyn's side on this one, but I don't know enough about anything. And she says, a man died because of your boy. And Sharon says he was trying to help someone in trouble. And Jocelyn says, haven't we heard that defense before? And Sharon just asks, why didn't you take his case? And Jocelyn says, because I didn't like you enough. And I always knew you would blame me if you lost, because that's what you always did. Even every time you didn't win, every time you missed out on a big brief, you always blame someone else. And... I am just dying to know more of the details. I really, really like, because from the context of this, I have no side. All I know is the impression Jocelyn is giving me. But, and, and the fact that I personally do not like Sharon. She's, she's defending a murderer pedophile and blackmailing a priest. <laughs> like, not likable. That doesn't mean that she was wrong in this instance, though, you know? Um, So that scene was very compelling. And then the very final scene, all of the research that Ellie has done in her sleepless hours, she discovered the name of this um, agricultural company. And when they mention it to Lee Ashworth, he has a bit of a reaction to it. And... I feel like it's definitely significant. And they go in there and she notices a smell and she sees this huge thing like this machine. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, that shit's a furnace. Look at that. Like, yikes. And indeed it is. And this is when Alex says, do you still think that she's still alive? Because... Ellie, she had posited that perhaps the elder girl killed the little girl and then ran away, which, you know, not a terrible story. But yeah, he's trying to be like, "Mm, I don't think she's still alive, actually, because we see Ash in the furnace. Now, we'll see about forensic testing. He says they burn dead animals in here, so there may not be any human remains, but who knows? Um, And yeah, that is the end of the episode. So Lisa Newberry. So she was the niece. I kept calling her the older sister. Why didn't any of you guys correct me on that? But she didn't live there. She just babysat. And she's the one that disappeared. Right? Right. But that wouldn't make, why would the mother still, like, if it was just her niece, why would she still live there hoping she comes home? She wouldn't come home there. I feel like I'm missing a trick here. Somebody let me know. But I am way over time, so I have to wrap. Thank you guys again very much for listening. I think, and thanks for hanging out with me. Um, And thank you again to Jesse for commissioning the episode. Uh, The next episode is May 4th. May the 4th be with you. So I will see you then. It'll be at 7 p.m. Central Time. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers.
was an unspoiled network podcast.